sister Fiona in Victoria, she shared a message with me about glyphosate, which I was totally unaware of. And when I saw the relevance of it and what it means to us and what it should mean to us, I couldn't wait to get back and share it because there's some things here that we need to be aware of today and truly take action against. If we want to be truly spiritual people, if we want to have a connection with God, be able to hear his voice in our lives, to discern the things he's wanting to tell us, we need to take some things on board today. And it's interesting that um, the right arm of the gospel was a major part of the, the message that God was giving Adventists in 1844 and shortly after. And, and I think that today we'll understand a little bit clearer and better why that right arm of the gospel is so important. In Ephesians chapter 6, we read, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. The whole armour of God we understand to be those things which protect us from error, heresy, from harm, from wrong. And included in that armour is a helmet. We're going to talk about the helmet in a minute. But we're told in Spirit Prophecy that the enemy will mingle his evil with every good work that is done. If the workers are not on guard, if thus he seeks to spoil God's purposes. What do we understand the helmet of the helmet to be? Salvation. salvation. Thanks, Neville. Um, it's the hope of salvation. Whereabouts in our body does the hope of salvation lie? Where do we process that hope? In our minds. So that helmet, is in, it's important that we have that helmet on, that we guard our minds, we guard our brains, the control centre of the body. I'm going to share with you a few bits of information now, about 30 slides, which may seem a little bit disjointed, but the last 30 are going to bring it all together, then you'll understand why. But I just want you to put some, there's some things I want to put in your mind and you'll see why as we get to the end. Um, in, after the, during the First World War, the League of Nations was a brainchild, you could say, of the elites, those who truly control the world's wealth and power and, and happenings. In 1919, that was set up in place and it was a forerunner for the United Nations, which came out of the Second World War and it was established in 1945. It's interesting <coughs> that we read that the reason for that setting up was to promote international cooperation and to achieve peace and security. That's referring to the League of Nations. That's why it was set up. And only a little over 20 years later do we see the Second World War even more horrendous than the First World War in many ways. And it was anything but a promotion of peace and international cooperation and security. You know how there's a masonry um, way of doing things that says that they get order out of chaos. They create the chaos, they give you the solution and out of that they get the order they want. Um, I have a question here and that is that was the First and Second World War was the United Nations brought up because of the First and Second World War? Or was the First and Second World War created for the United Nations? It's a good question because we know, history has shown us plainly, that wars are brought about for a specific reason. Diplomacy these days especially can be handled in such a way that peace can be brought about. If men want peace, they can have peace. But when men want war, especially these elites, those who have the power to do so, they will bring war about. And I believe the war was brought about for this very reason. To bring about a system of a United Nations which was going to help bring about a one world order, one world government. Through that they were going to control and control the world but set up what they call a utopia. That is the perfect world the way they see it. The way they believe it should be run. The way they, they believe is best. And these are people who don't think 
with sound, sane minds as average people do. They have, there's, they're like on a different plane of humanity. It's a funny thing, but um, the, the thought just left me. Um, their, their, their idea of a better world is a sentiment that was expressed 6,000 years ago at the beginning of rebellion. And it travels down exactly the same path. And we keep this in mind because we need to be aware of what's happening today and what the wiles of the devil are. In the United Nations um, uh, Treaty and Conference they held in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, there was an agenda brought up called Agenda 21, 21 stands for the 21st century. It says that it was a non-binding, voluntary, implemented action plan of the United Nations with regard to sustainable development. It is an action agenda for the United Nations, other multilateral organisations and individual governments around the world that can be executed on a local, national or global level. Now, this is what they told the people. This is what the agenda was on that, at that meeting. Some of the items on that agenda were these. There was quite a whole sheet on this. Um, Sister Rosie helped me do a lot of uh, research on this and it's amazing what she dug up. They say that they, they're determined to protect the planet from degradation, including through sustainable consumption and production, sustainable managing, sustainably managing its natural resources and taking ur urgent action on climate change so that it can support the needs of the present and future generations. So in this agenda point, they're saying that through sustainable consumption and production, it's talking about food supply, agriculture, that they have a way of managing it. Up until now, we've seen poverty and famine in the world, many, millions of people starving. They've never had, had even gone close to being able to cater for that. And these people say they can do it. They also say that we resolve between now and 2030, so they have a deadline. This is only 13 years away. To end poverty, hunger everywhere. To combat inequalities within and among countries. To build peaceful, just and inclusive societies. To protect human rights and promote gender equality. And the empowerment of women and girls and to ensure the lasting protection of the planet and its natural resources. This is part of their utopia. At the end there we're told that, and also just before the end there, they reaffirm all outcomes of all major UN conferences. Of course they're going to do that because that's their agenda. At the end we're told we are committed to ending poverty in all its forms and dimensions, including by eradicating extreme poverty by 2030. Now I want to ask you a question. How would you, if you had the opportunity and the power to eradicate poverty, how would you do it? There's probably only two ways that I could come up with. If anyone can think of a third, you can tell me. But how can you eradicate poverty? Eradicate poverty. That's one. Good. And what's the other one? Say again. Yeah, that's one. There's another one. If you had the power and you had the money, could you not make the people not poverty, not, not poor? Couldn't you do that? You could give them the money, set them up, educate them, give them homes, farms, whatever. You could do that, couldn't you? The people I'm speaking about, these elites, they have the power to do that. Their wealth is estimated in the hundreds of thousands of trillions of dollars. One trillion dollars is 1,000 billion. They have the power to eradicate poverty if they wanted to, and they could have done it decades ago, not now. If their agenda to eradicate poverty was based on setting people up and bringing them out of poverty, that could have already happened, and it could easily happen still now if that was the agenda. But we've only got two options, and that is to decrease, get rid of these poor people, get them out of the way, or prop them up. Um, at least could stand out poverty if they wanted to. Do you know that um, the Bible spoke about this thousands of years ago? I'll show you something. I was amazed to hear this. When you go home today or after the service, read the first eight verses of Isaiah 32. In verse 7 we're told, the instruments also of the churl are evil. He deviseth wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speak of right. Even when there's a need, even when the needy are good. The churl, this churl, devise evil and wickedness against them. This word churl comes from a word, there's a Strong's references here, that means niggardly 
Does everyone know what niggardly means? Mean means miserly, greedy. These people, the churl, they're niggardly, mean, miserly, greedy people. They're not about to stamp out poverty by giving money because it goes totally against what they stand for. They want to control and have them and they don't want to give it away. But the day of the Lord is coming, friends, and these people will answer to God even though they don't realise now that that day is coming. They, don't, they may not believe it. The cup of iniquity is nearly filled and the retributive, retributive justice of God is about to descend upon the guilty. The wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up at the measure of their iniquity. The earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to do his will upon it. That's where we are right now. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. We know that all these quotes were referring to the end times leading up to the time of trouble and the time of trouble itself. We know that. But there's more to it because leading up to the time of trouble, people need to be placed in a state of mind where they will all wander after the beast. And we know that that's going to happen. So how are they going to do it? Apart from those who will be wiped out because they just will not conform, there will be um, uh, terrible things happening. We should be now praying the prayer of Jehoshaphat. If, when evil cometh upon us as a sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then wilt thou, then wilt he, thou wilt heal out and help us. This should be our prayer. We know that God will protect his people in the end times. Their food and water will be sure. We know that we have nothing to concern us as far as temporal needs are, are concerned. It's interesting in this verse, and in a few others I'll just show you now, the word um, pestilence is used. In a broader sense, uh, the definition here from Webster's Dictionary, which says that it's a plague, appropriately so called, but in a general sense, any contagious or infectious disease that is epidemic and mortal. So anything that can kill you, that's an epidemic, that reaching many people, can be termed as pestilence. So if we have the right, and this is from the 1828 Webster's, so it's what they understood the word to mean back then as well. It can mean literal famine, of course, when we read famine, of course, and that, that's going to happen as well. We don't de deny that. Paul uses the same word famine. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? Do we ever stop and think about, will we stand through every one of those trials? Are we prepared to go through that now? Is that our lot and is that, is that what we have... Um, is that what we have prepared ourselves for? Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Famine seems to be everywhere in the warnings for end times. So, does, so is pestilence. That's mentioned a number of times in the Bible. So... I just want to open your minds up now to knowing how things, uh, what things have been already warned, told us, which, were, which are going to come about. There's, um, you know that, as far as famine is concerned, you know that you, you can eat a lot of food, but even, even be overweight, and still be starving your body. Because the food that you're eating is not satisfying the needs the body has, not feeding the cells which need to operate in a particular manner. So we're not talking about quantity of food either. If we make the definition of famine broader, we can see that it can also imply uh, wrong food or lack of nutrients, not just lack of quantity. In Mark chapter 10, we read, What therefore God have joined together, let no man put asunder. This passage of scripture in Mark 10 is in contents of the marriage between a man and a woman. But the principle of not tearing apart anything that God has put together applies to all of God's creation, not just marriage, it applies to everything. And there was a, a great medical missionary of the late day, a man by the name of Al Wolfson, 
who did a great work, especially around the islands, helping people with sickness. And he would quote this verse repeatedly. The reason he would quote it was that he, he found that the wrong use of food, and especially in the modern day in Western cultures, the tearing apart of food is what was causing the most harm to people's health. You know how food companies today are notorious for pulling all substances out of food, tearing apart and using one substance in one way and another in another, and at the end the product they give you is like a synthetic food. They've pulled it apart, manipulated it and put it together the way they want for whatever reasons. Maybe it's more profitable, I don't know. It seems to be a lot of trouble when God has given us whole food to make us healthy and we, we can eat it just as it is. And that's what we need for proper nutri nutri nutrition. Um, I want to show you now just a little bit of biology on the human cell to try and, uh, try and help you to understand why, where we're going with all this. Human cells display a variety of sizes, from small red blood cells that measure 76 thousandths of a millimetre, next to nothing, to liver cells that may be 10 times larger. Just to give you an idea of what that means, because it's hard to, to understand that figure, about 10,000 average size cells fit on the head of a pin. 10,000, so that's how tiny they are. That's a human cell, and that's a gen generally speaking, because there are larger ones. Now, if you have a look at the picture of the cell there, you can see many different things happening within there and many different components. We won't go through all this now, but um, it's a very interesting study. The molecules in there doing different things within a cell, 10,000 of which fit on the head of a pin. Atoms, the very basis of human construction, make molecules. Molecules make cells. Cells make tissue, tissue organ, and a system of those makes a human organism. That's how God created us. We're talking today more on the molecular level. This is where we're going to go. But I want you to see that we're talking about such a minute particle that is in our bodies. Molecules make up the cell, and many of them too. So I'm going to show you some pictures in, in, in a short while. Um, it's no wonder that David said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul know of right well. It's amazing some of the words we hear from patriarchs and prophets and people that God raised in times past that had a right appreciation of the, the God's creation without having the science that we have today. Um, I'll speak more about that in a moment. About several years ago, we learnt uh, that there is a protein cell in our bodies called laminin. Some of you may remember the, the talk that was given by one uh, preacher that came across this, or the first one to speak on it, and that protein molecule is shaped like a man or like a cross. And it would be no coincidence that that is a protein molecule that holds other molecules together to combine, combined making up, making up a, a, a cell. It's an important role that this protein molecule has because of the, its binding capability, because without that, the cells could not function the way they need to in our bodies. Um, there's a picture above there which is showing you uh, a protein molecule made up of atoms, different colored, and the little diagram on the left shows you what those different at atoms are. And if you look at the second last one there we'll be speaking about, it's got amino acids side chain. So amino acids are very important for making proteins. Without them, you actually cannot make a protein. You need amino acids in your body. It's probably no surprise that just as Christianity, which is held together by the cross, which is the basis of Christianity, is the cross, the sacrifice that Christ made for us. That's what binds true Christians together, even when their beliefs may vary. But it's a cross that, that, that moves a person to want to follow Christ and to want to live as a Christian. It's interesting that as that does that to Christianity, so does the lemon and molecule in, in the human makeup. It does exactly the same work. And so it's no, probably no surprise that as Christianity is under attack, so is this protein molecule now, along with many others also. There's a little picture here, diagram I've got off online. It's just showing you some functions and um, uh, you could call a pathway of cell activity in the body. 
many of us know about uh, T cells and different cells which do good work in our body. Some of those functions, killer T cells have X-ray vision. They are able to see inside our body's own cells simply by scanning the surface. This mechanism allows killer T cells to hunt down and destroy cells that are infected with germs or that have become cancerous. The other main type of T cells are, helper, are called helper T cells. Helper T cells orchestrate an immune response and play important roles in all arms of immunity. These multifunctional cells have the ability to scan the inter, uh, intracellular environment for foreign invaders, directly kill viral or bacterial infected cells, naturally eradicate cancer cells, activate and help other immune cells that ingest germs or that make anti-infection molecules called antibodies, and remember a germ that they encountered decades ago. You can see just by this short description, and there's more, that these cells are important, especially our T cells. That's what helps keep us healthy. Without them doing their right work, your body cannot fight off cancer or really any disease, cannot fight off anything because these are the cells that do that particular work. And protein molecules are needed to make these cells. So it makes sense that protein molecules are important in our bodies and so are these cells. That's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? It gets a little bit more com complex when we talk about the molecules. Sometimes an error in just one amino acid can cause a disease. There's 20 different types of amino acids. Nine are essential. And there's a few that our body can make, but there's, a lot, there's these nine that can't. These nine have to be, have to be um, gotten from food. One example of, of one amino acid going wrong uh, causes this disease called sickle cell disease, which most often affects those of African descent. It causes, it's caused by a single error in the gene for haemoglobin, the oxygen-carrying protein in red blood cells. This error or mutation results in an incorrect amino acid at one position in the molecule. It's not doing anything wrong, it's just in the wrong place. Remember the little chain we saw there earlier, the pictures on the right-hand side there? There's a chain made up of molecules and these amino acids now, um, these atoms, sorry, making up a molecule. Now, they have to be in the right position as well. So when David said, you know, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, I wonder if that was just an understatement, maybe not having an understanding of these things, unless, you know, God showed him things that, that he was more appreciative of than we are today. Hemoglobin molecules with this incorrect amino acid, stick together and distort the normally smooth lozenge-shaped red blood cells into jagged seagull shapes. The distorted blood cells jam together, unable to pass through small blood vessels, and these blockages prevent oxygen-carrying blood from getting to organs and tissues. So what would happen without protein molecules? Pro proteins are, in effect, the main actioners in cells and in the entire organism. Without proteins, the most basic and vital functions of life could not be carried out. Respiration and heart pulsation, for example, requires muscle contractions, and muscle contractions require proteins. So the most basic function of our life, breathing, requires protein cells. There's a little bit more on these molecules. Along with carbohydrates, fats, and, and nuclei acids, proteins are the building blocks of life. It's an essential macromolecule without which our bodies would be unable to repair, regulate, or protect themselves. Proteins are made up of hundreds or thousands of amino acids which are attached to one another in long chains called polypeptides. There are 20 different types of amino acids that can be combined to make protein in humans. The sequence of amino acids determines each protein's unique three-dimensional structure and its specific function. The compounds found in human peptides and proteins are made from the 20 different amino acids, nine of which are essential. essential. Our bodies can synthesize, that is to make, some amino acids, but many of them must be obtained from the diet. The nine essential amino acids cannot be made by the body, so they must, be, they must come from food. And we're talking about whole foods here. When we eat protein from foods, we must break it down into smaller, simpler amino acid com components then our bodies reassemble the amino acids into our body protein. But that's how the body functions, that's what makes it survive. And it's interesting, you know, that um, regeneration of cells through this process is greater than destruction of cells if 
the body is treated correctly if we're eating correct food, if our diet's right. And that's interesting because we can now see why when Adam and Eve were first created, there was no limit to their life. It could be immortal based on obedience, but it could be immortal because of the way they were made, because of the, the ability the body has to reproduce cells in a right environment. And they had the perfect environment. They had the best food, the, 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 the most wholesome food, which would help the body to perform in this fashion and live forever. Other functions also include proteins provide the building material for growth and repair of body tissues. Also, vital parts of the body structures such as skin, nails, hair, teeth, muscles, bones, organs, ligaments, tendons and membranes. We're going to talk about membranes next. Regulate chemical reactions, body fluids, transport nutrients in and out of cells and around the body. They're all important functions. So we truly are fearfully and wonderfully made, aren't we? When we read these things, it's just it's, it's amazing what God has done in the creation of man. Um, I want to share with you these tight junctions, which I just found out about. In a tight junction, a series of integral protein molecules in the plasma membranes of adjacent cells fuse together, forming an impermeable junction that encircles a cell. Tight junctions help prevent molecules from passing through the space between adjacent cells. For example, tight junctions between cell linings, um, the digestive tract keeps digestive e e enzymes and microorganisms in the intestine from leaking into the bloodstream. This is like a sheath, a membrane, a barrier you could say, which stops things that shouldn't get out from getting out and things that shouldn't get in from getting in. It's important that this membrane is kept intact and this is all right throughout our bodies, our skin, our intestinal lining especially, where it's most important, has to be kept intact, it has to be healthy. If you look at the picture there you'll notice the little green dots are the protein uh, molecules which help keep this membrane together. It's like it's tying it all together, holding it, holding it in place. What can and cannot go through tight junctions all depends on the substance's size charge as well as the location and precise composition of the tight junction in that part of the body. A tight junction, a kind of symmetrical cell junction, is composed of numerous important proteins. Again we see the importance of proteins here that are either directly involved in its composition or, or intimately involved with connecting the tight junction to and between the cells. A bit more. Tight junctions are located within our body's internal and external surfaces. This includes organs such as the skin, blood vessels and cavities. Tight junctions serve various functions depending on what body part is in question. In the skin they keep us somewhat watertight and help keep allergens out of our body. In the digestive system they help prevent the leakage of digestive en enzymes into our bloodstream. You've heard of people with a condition called leaky gut, leaky gut syndrome. All that is is a tight junction which is ruptured and not performing its job. And it's allowing toxins and other foreign matter to escape and get into your bloodstream and then you have all sorts of side effects and problems and it's a very very difficult thing to repair and some people suffer with this ailment or this breakdown for you know a major part of their lives. There's a, a statement I found and I'll, I'll show you who said this in a moment but this, this young man said that tight junctions at the gut wall are the foundation of health, the foundation of health. These tight junctions are so important for helping um, keeping our, our health intact and our body functioning correctly. He calls it the foundation of health that affects the gut, blood vessels and organs, and then he includes, including the brain. He's starting here, and we'll, we'll, this is where we're going to go now, the connection between the brain and the gut, so important. And this information I'm sharing with you now just started to come out in 2015, only two years ago. This is where science is right now. And right now, the people who are the most diligent and, and honest in natural uh, remedies and naturopathy uh, are all studying this right now because it's new and it's showing them things that we did not understand before, or even things that we had a wrong understanding of before. But look at what the spirit of prophecy said in the 1800s. By the inspiration of the spirit of God, Paul the Apostle writes... So whatsoever you do, even the natural act of eating or drinking, should be done not to gratify a perverted appetite, but under a sense of responsibility. Do all to the glory of God. Every part of the man is to be guarded. We talked about the armour. 
the diet and the food that you eat is, a, is an important part of that if you want to protect your mind. We are to beware lest that which is taken into the stomach shall banish from the mind high and holy thoughts. A direct connection between the gut and the brain. And science is just starting to catch up and we'll just see how close they're getting to. Um, I want to um, introduce you to this young man. His name is Zach Bush. This is a, the first video that uh, Fiona sent us. It was a, an interview between him and Dr. McCola. A lot of you would have heard of Dr. McCola in America. He's a strong naturopathy um, promoter. And the, worst, the, the medical association over there really hate these people because of the, the things that they reveal, which are correct and true, and helping people. And, and uh, a medical association, especially big pharma, are so against that, they don't want you well. This, this young man here spent 17 years studying at different universities and went into probably more depth than you know, most people would. He has a passion for studying, you know. Um, you've got to see, there's, a, there's a, a YouTube link I'll show you in a minute, but uh, you've got to see his personal testimony too. One morning, this guy's so into what he's doing, He's studying under his microscope before going to work as a medical doctor. He spends his spare time studying, you know, he just he loves his work. And one morning as he was studying some micro um, activity, uh, it's as though the, the Lord was speaking to him. He's, by no, as far as I can tell, by no means religious, he speaks about evolution and so on. And he just hasn't been told about that yet. But he was finding out the activity of, of microbes. And that morning he went to work and started to help a patient who had this terrible ulcer on his ankle, couldn't, couldn't heal, and it stunk, and it was just horrible, incurable. And as he was uh, analysing the uh, damage on the tissue, what he was studying that morning helped him to make a connection as to why the molecules were not doing the, the function they were doing. He had spent time trying to help people um, in natural ways, even with food, with supplementation, with organic foods, with all sorts of things, trying to find a way to get these people healthy that had different ailments. And so he wasn't close to um, natural medicine, although he came from the Western medicine background. But once he made this connection, this discovery, he was able to, able to trace it back to the, the nutrients from the food being faulty, and then back to the soil itself, microbes in the soil. So he knew exactly what was going on with why people were not being healed. Since he, since he uncovered this and shared it and with his colleagues he was working with, some uh, have supported him and um, actually his testimony is it's really good. He, he feels like he stumbled onto this information but when you listen to how it came about you'd, you'd have to say that God was leading him because he was out of a job and funding for different places where he was work, working as a scientist all closed on him and it led him down this path where he ended up here. It's as though God wanted this information out and he had selected this man here to do it. That's how it seems to me in any case. But he, he made a couple of statements. One of them, there, see, it's, it's written there, intercellular, intercellular communication. He's talking about the communication between cells in the body. And he says that a breakdown of that communication is what leads to all diseases. He actually says there is no disease, there's no such thing as disease. What there is is there are a lack or breakdown of communication between cells. That's what makes you sick. And when you hear this fellow talk, it's amazing. He really knows what he's talking about. You can tell his study, but um, just some amazing findings. Anyway, he said that these malfunctions, all these malfunctions start in the gut. Now, these two main statements I want you to remember. It starts in your gut, which is of course affected by the food you eat. And it's a cause of all illnesses. This is where the part of glyphosate comes into the talk. This is off the Monsanto website. If there's a company on earth which is uh, truly doing Satan's bidding in trying to harm people, it has to be this company along with big, the pharmaceutical companies. Roundup, which is registered trademark, Agricultural herbicides are the flagship of Monsanto's agricultural chemicals business. Do you know what flagship means? It means it's it's his, it's his star. It's leading product. It's number one product. It's it's what Monsanto is built upon. We know about Monsanto with their seed 
uh, manipulation and, 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 and monopoly over the world. But they call their flagship, they call that Roundup. This is how important Roundup is to this company. Not, and I don't believe it's just for money, but certainly it's bringing in big, big money for them. We'll see that a bit later too. Um, Roundup herbicides and other glyphosate products can be used as part of an environmentally responsible, listen to these words, this is from Monsanto, environmentally responsible um, weed control program and fit with our vision of sustainable agriculture and environmental protection. They're saying that they have a, they have a solution to help sustain agriculture, right? They also say that it's environmentally responsible, maybe for the vision that they have, certainly not for um, responsibility towards people's health. The original Roundup herbicide contained, containing the active ingredient glyphosate was introduced in 1974. Today, Monsanto's glyphosate products are registered in more than 130 countries and are approved for weed control in more than 100 crops. No other herbicide active ingredient compares in terms of number of approved uses. Remember this word sustainable? Look at this. Agenda 21. We are determined to protect the planet from degradation, including through sustainable consumption and production. It's all dealing with agriculture. They want to bring about a sustainable system of food for the world, for what they all would also call a, a, an environmentally responsible agenda. Um, probably no need for me to say Monsanto is a, uh, a partner company of the United Nations, along with many other corrupt organisations as well. And if there's a few good ones in there, don't be surprised, It'll make it look good. It says that, including for sustainable consumption and production, sustainably managing its natural resources and taking urgent action upon climate change so that it can support the needs of the present and future generations. And remember what they said, we are committed to ending poverty in all its forms and dimensions, including by eradicating extreme poverty by 2030. Okay, that's off. That's off the Agenda 21 in 1992 or 94. Continues. Monsanto's Agenda 21 and globalisation. This is a heading that, this is not Monsanto website, but a person speaking about it, someone who's a bit switched on, and they say, Monsanto, among many other powerful corporations in America, is known for its hypocritical business model and its glorious past from helping to build the first atomic bomb and poisoning more than five million Vietnamese with Asian orange which resulted in 400,000 deaths and disabilities to its monopoly on the total market control over the world's food, foods and seeds. Recently, Monsanto, among many other powerful corporations, including the big banks and the giant oil companies, has joined the so-called World Business Council for Sustainable Development, pursuing the United Nations so-called Agenda 21. They're all wrapped in it together. What are they going to do? The time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us. I know this is talking about the period of the close of probation. And we shall need an experience with which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent to obtain. The reason I'm sharing the quote is for this. We must not be indolent to put in place and put in action changes in our lives that are needed, especially when we're dealing with practices which are going to take our mind away from God. Our understanding away from the scriptures, our discernment, our, we'll look at this a little bit more in a minute, but anything that's going to stand between us and God, we must not be indolent. We have to do whatever we can to help that, to make sure that God can communicate with us, just like the cell communication that Zach Bush talks about. We need to have that communication with God. And now, while the precious Saviour is making an atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. The only way you'll become perfect in Christ is if you can hear his voice and obey it and follow in it. And so we need to have that communication. The wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short, and his work of deceit and destruction reaches its culmination in the time of trouble. And that's where we're headed. What is glyphosate? Glyphosate is a unique molecule. There's no other herbicide like it. In fact, it's in a group all of its own, herbicide group M. How does it work? Glyphosate inhibits an essential plant en enzyme called this, as I'm going to say, and it affects its shikimite pathway. That, that word shikimite, we're going to look at this next. 
The inhibition of this enzyme prevents production of aromatic amino acids required for protein synthesis. See that last sentence? With what I've already just shared with you so far, can you see where it's going? Can you see what glyphosate is doing? It's stopping amino acids from doing their work, which is producing proteins, which are needed, and we're going to see now, not only for plants, that's how it kills the plant, by disrupting this pathway. That's what it's doing to us. The shikimide pathway is a bacterial pathway present in plants. Until recently, it was thought that other living things did not have this shikimide pathway. However, it now turns out that the human microbiome has this pathway, as does every living creature in the soil, as we are a microbial world. Just so we can understand what, um, what our microbiome is, I'll just put this one slide. Our microbiome is a collection of microorganisms and their collective genetic material residing in or on the human body. The human micro microbiota is microorganisms that reside on the surface and in deep layers of the skin, in the saliva, oral mucosa, and the gastrointestinal tracts. All three of these are dealing with our digestion. All three. Okay, very important because it's through that digestion that we get the nutrients we need to be healthy. We depend on a vast army of microbes to stay alive. My microbiome protects us against germs, breaks down food to release energy and produces vitamins. Understanding the microbiome in humans is as important as the human genome. And this is just where they're getting to now with science. They're just starting to understand this. Um, the Vital Force website, our friends in New Zealand and here in Victoria, um, this is from Fiona, this is how she puts it in a very simple way. Glyphosate kills plants by disrupting their shikimite pathway. This in turn kills bacteria in the plants the plant needs to produce amino acids. Amino acids are used to build proteins. Without proteins, the plant dies. That's why the plant dies, because of what, the work it's done. This is how plants are killed by Roundup. The glyphosate slips itself into the shikimite pathway wherever glycine is required. Now this is really interesting. Glycine is an uh, amino acid or amino acid which is needed for the production of proteins. This means protein synthesis cannot happen in the plant because glyphosate is a great pretender. And being spiritual, um, Fiona says, oh, so spiritual. So close, the bacteria in the plant thinks that glyphosate is glycine. So glyphosate inter interrupts protein synthesis in the bacterial pathway of the plant and the plant dies. As Godhead believers, we can relate to this if you want to draw an object lesson from it. The one that came in pretending to be the God that we should serve is a great pretender. He's not the one that we should serve. And just as he came in, he takes the place of the true God, and through that destroys the people who think they're worshipping God. Just as, this, just as this molecule, glyphosate molecule, is doing to plants and to us. What I, found in, what I found really amazing when I read it the first time was this. At the bottom it says, worse still, glyphosate binds aluminium and transports it into the brain. This is amazing. What, what do we know aluminium does or causes? What's one of the causes? Worse good? dementia. You know, do you know that our um, blame blood bar barrier has a natural resistance and uh, protection from allowing aluminium to enter the brain? God has made us that way. He's placed that there to protect us from aluminium. If we don't, if we don't do anything wrong or manipulate it, we will always be free of aluminium, always. Glyphosate actually, by, uh, we'll see it later, glyphosate is a chelator of metals. It binds the aluminium and carries it into the brain. It can get through. Isn't that amazing? I'm thinking to myself, wow, the one thing you don't want in there, and Satan's found a way to bring it in. And bring it in, you know, in, in who knows what amounts, depending on what your lifestyle is like. The amino acid glycine is among the simplest amino acids and is the most used amino acid biochemically speaking. Specifically, glycine is made from the amino acid serine via an enzyme known as SHMT. I don't know what it stands for, but I'll just show you this. Pretending to be the amino acid glycine, 
Glyphosate can cross the blood-brain barrier and start interfering in our brain chemistry. It can misfold proteins and cause them to behave unnaturally and perform unintended tasks with potential negative effects for us. It can and does get into our bone marrow and start producing T cells and helper T cells with this rogue chemical fitted in place of glycine. You know what rogue is, don't you? It's an imposter. It's good for nothing. It looks like the real thing. You know, you've got a, an empl a rogue employee of a, of a company. He looks like he's serving the company. He's doing the exact opposite. That's a rogue employee. This is a rogue molecule. Um, it can uh, get into our DNA and RNA and be responsible for producing potentially dangerous uh, transgenic mutants in our offsprings that will show negative effects even a few generations down the line. When I read this, a few generations down the line, you know, we're the first generation under this attack. You realise that, don't you? Because it didn't start before 1974. It wasn't invented. But it's now in our chemtrails, which they didn't start till the 90s. So we are the first generation being affected by this. We have not seen the conclusion or the result that it's going to bring. But if time lasts, in another generation or two, we're going to see exactly where that's leading. We're going to see the results of it. We're not seeing it yet, although there's an epidemic even happening now amongst ourselves. And once it is into our biology, there is no effective way for our immune system or for man to get rid of it and replace it, molecule by molecule, with the original glycine. It's terrible. It gets in and doesn't get out. Um, amazing. So we've got to be really careful of what we eat. We've got to be aware of Satan's devices. The shikimite pathway does exist in our microbiome. The trillions of bacteria living mostly in our, in our digestive tract. Bacteria, previously thought to be the villain killer in the human race, has now been shown to perform unknown numbers of essential actions to keep us alive and healthy. This is huge because it means every human, animal or insect which eats plants grown in the soil sprayed with glyphosate before planting is eating glyphosate and you can't get rid of it. After consuming glyphosate, it begins to work its sentence of death on the shikimai pathway and beyond. Almost every disease you are seeing increasing in our world today can be linked back to the disruption of the shikimai pathway. The current information about shikimai pathway is just scratching the tip of the iceberg. It's because they've just only embarked upon it and realised what's going on. Up until two years ago, they didn't think it even existed in the human body. Now they know for a fact that it does. And that's why that food's affecting us the way it is. This is a different website. The last one we saw was our friends at Vital Force. This is a different mob on the internet. And they say, the microbiota is a housekeeper for the digestive system. They manufacture free essential amino acids using a seven-step metabolic route called the shikimite pathway. However, the consumption of genetically modified organisms in our diet, heavily laden with the herbicide glyphosate, disrupts this pathway and over time erodes your health. This is coming from separate studies. Look at this picture. Um, it's got three, three things here. Up the top, there's a brain. The, on the right, the, um, the gut. And on the left, the human, uh, representing the human immune system, right? And how they're connected. You see this word in blue at the top? Cognition? Cognition? Does anyone, does everyone know what cognition means? We've heard it before. Um, it's a mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. Now, I want to read you some, some synonyms for cognition, and I want you to think, how are these affecting you with your Bible studies and connection with God? Listen to them. Perception, discernment, awareness, apprehension, understanding, comprehension, enlightenment, insight, intelligence, reasoning, thinking, and learning. Do we not need every single one of those when we want to learn spiritual things? And do not we need that, every single one of those if we want to get close to the Lord? Satan has found a way to hinder, to, to hold that back. And for those who don't have the health message, the right arm of the gospel, they're going to be greatly hindered. You wonder why there's so many people in the world that can't accept or understand the truth. We're starting to understand now why that, why that is so. And also, it's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse. We're just at the beginning of it. Unwholesome food destroys the healthy action of the digestive organs, affects the brain, and perverts the judgment, 
preventing rational, calm, healthy thinking and acting. Do you remember all the synonyms I read out? You see here? Every one of them here is covered. It affects the brain, perverts the judgment, preventing rational, calm, healthy thinking and acting. Every one of them is affected, and we were told about this in 1890. The brain is affected by the condition of the stomach. A disordered stomach is productive of a disordered, uncertain state of mind. A diseased stomach produces a diseased condition of the brain. See that? A, a diseased stomach produces a diseased condition of the brain. The connection is, is, is intact and often makes a man obstinate in maintaining erroneous opinions. She wrote this as a spiritual counsel in 1890 and science today is just confirming what she wrote back then. GE crops are far more contaminated with glyphosate than conventional crops, courtesy of the fact that they are engineered to withstand extremely high levels of Roundup without perishing along with the weed. And I remember Bill shared a little while ago how they actually put Roundup, we didn't know the glyphosate then, but Roundup, they put it into the seed of the crop. Monsanto does, they're specialists at it. They put the, they put the we know now it's glyphosate, into the seed so it becomes immune or resistant to it. Then when they spray their weeds around that crop, the weeds will die but the crop remains. So it's easy for the farmer, but unfortunately they're killing the population in the process. So it's defeating the purpose of growing food. The seven top genetically modified crops in the US, and look at these, corn and soya. Unbelievable, these two, we've got to get these right out of our system immediately. Now I mean immediately, when you go home today, I'm going to show you some things now. When you go home today, if you've got corn and soya, which is not organic, I'm telling you, pick it up and throw it in the bin straight away. Don't waste time, don't think about it, just do it. Just do it. Corn is the number one crop grown in the US. Look, 88% of it is genetically modified. Soya, 93% of it. In America, cottonseed's big. You, you know, sometimes, have you ever heard of cottonseed oil? Sometimes you're buying a product that's got cottonseed oil, and you, what do you think? You don't think anything of it. It's highly contaminated, highly contaminated with glyphosate. It doesn't sound like a bad thing, but once you know what's going into it, it's a different story altogether. They got alfalfa. When I saw papaya, I thought to myself, well, you've got this most beautiful fruit that God's created, papaya. And you want to go and ruin it by putting glyphosate in it, by, by genetically modifying it, when there's nothing wrong with that food to start with. Leave, just leave it alone. What God has joined together, let no man put us under. Anyway, it goes down the line. There's canola we know of and sugar beets, the sweet white beetroots. In Australia, look at this, top two again, corn and soy, the top two. And, th and I was surprised to see tomatoes come in food. Tomatoes, that wasn't the case in the US, but it is here. And I thought, wow, this is strange. I mean, everyone buys tomatoes. I don't know anyone that doesn't like tomatoes. Canola's there again, papayas, beets, and guineas is part of milk. Now, Listen to this carefully. There's already the plan in action to genetically modify rice and to fill it with glyphosate. It's already prepared. It's already been approved in America. It's already approved, but they haven't started farming it yet, but it's going to happen. Why in the world they would want to touch rice, I don't know. Wheat is in the same basket. Actually, wheat's even worse than that. Wheat is desiccated, that is dried, with Roundup. They spray it after it's harvested to help it dry up quicker and fuller. So it's full of glyphosate before it gets to, it gets to you. Now I want to, I want to share, share with you. Once you've got corn, which is already there, then rice and then wheat, what population on earth is not affected by glyphosate? They're the three main staple diets this earth has. In the Western society we've got wheat. The Asians and many other countries, India, you've got rice. And the African nations are all based on maize, corn. They live on it. That's their only staple diet. Some people eat corn twice a day, that's it, that's their diet. Twice a day. And George knows. So, once they've got those three, what have they done to the world's food supply? Potatoes are on the way. And the quote there finishes at the end. Thank God someone's got some common sense. For potatoes to eat at home, look for certified organic produce only. I mean, most people like potatoes. Make sure they just make sure they're organic. Dr. McCullough made this little statement uh, dealing with glyphosate. He says, negative impact on the body is insidious 
and manifest slowly over time as inflammation damages cellular system throughout the body. This word insidious, when I heard it for a while, this really fits well, this fits perfectly. You notice the, the, the dictionary meaning is it's proceeding in a gradual, subtle way, but with very harmful effects. Do we not see the same thing in spiritual things? Insidious. It comes in as if it's all right. It looks all right. It you know, sounds all right. But the conclusion of it is dreadful. Look at the synonyms. Tell me who this reminds you of. Stealthy, subtle, sneaky, cunning, crafty, guileful, sly, willy, tricky, slick, deceitful, deceptive, dishonest, underhanded, backhanded, indirect. This is satanic through and through. The statement he made is spot on. Could not have found a better word to describe the work of glyphosate. It's amazing. But we are those who have received the grace of Christ and by his grace we are, to, we are what we are. Then let us glorify God in our weakness, having a sense of our inefficiency. If we want to bring glory to God, we can fight against this. I want to share a solution with you in, in a little while, in a minute. Unless Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now I want to show you a little table that Zach Bush put together to show you just how serious the, the epidemic is now. This is current figures, but it's going to get worse. Autism, is it, and this is what he's saying, all starts in the gut. Every one of these diseases, he, he can actually prove to you and show you, they start in your gut. Autism, one in 45 people are affected by autism at different levels. Attention deficit disorder, one in 10, and 70% of those are medicated. Asthma, one in 10. Allergy, one in four. Diabetes, one in four. Obesity, one in three. Major depression, one in two. Cancer, one in two. Look at this last one, friends. Dementia. Look at it. One in one. One in one. That means there's, there's, there cannot be a person... If his study is correct, there cannot be a person on, on this planet that is not affected by dementia. And when we stop and think that Adam had 20 times the vital force that man has today, we can see that there is something greatly lacking. We are certainly losing the vital force that God created us with. And I know that there are many factors well before glyphosate ever came about that have brought that about also, I understand that. But I'm looking at the, the potential risk and danger that we face today in this very time. And Zach Bush is putting that down to this, this problem with glyphosate and the lack of microbes and wrong microbes in the soil. That's where he's brought it to, all back to the soil. And doesn't that make perfect sense? I mean, if God created man, he would have given him the diet that he needed to sustain him. And that diet had to come from the very soil that he created. And the way he created it is the way that it should be in order to sustain us the way he wanted. So this makes perfect sense to me. All these illnesses start in the gut. If you look carefully, four of them, autism, attention deficit, major depression and dementia, they're all dealing with the mind. They're all dealing with the mind. That's not by coincidence. And all starting from the shikimate pathway. The shikimate pathway is responsible for many happenings in an organism. And these complex processes, which are not completely understood yet, are dependent upon the health of our microbiome. This means our understanding of cells doing all the work is now pretty outdated, as the bacteria do a tremendous amount of work also, including communicating with the cell. That communication is what, where Zach Bush's studies are really um, excelling at, at the present time. Um, there's a, a website, if you have the time to write this down, there's two slides with it, if you want to write it down. If you can't, don't worry, I'll send it to you by email. Um, it's got 178 studies on it on glyphosate. 178 studies. There's some incredible things on there. Well, on there you'll find that glyphosate is water soluble, which allows it to get into groundwater and reservoirs. Groundwater does evaporate, then come down in the rain. So it's, it's, it's being recycled continually. Glyphosate kills the ecosystem in the soil. Glyphosate is found in breast milk, even in women avoiding Roundup. It's like you can't get away, with, away from it. Women eating, say, organic food, it's even found in them. Glyphosate is also found in organic grains in smaller quantities. Glyphosate chelates metals and trace minerals. You know, I'm sure Bill would be able to confirm that one of the biggest problems a farmer has today is to get the right trace minerals in the soil. It's through those that we get a good healthy crop. And it's the, trace, the right balance of them also that gives you good food. And farmers go to extremes, and honest farmers go to extremes, to try to build up their soil, to make it as healthy as possible so the crop is good. And glyphosate 
very efficiently takes that out of your body. After all the trouble that farmers go to to try to get it into you, and, and that's the few farmers who are honest, not to mention the many farmers who are using forced farming practices who don't even, are not concerned for trace minerals because they're using synthetic fertilisers and different farming methods which do not give you the nutrients in the first place. But if you happen to get some, glyphosate will take them out. Glyphosate is called systemic. Um, it's total and complete. It's, it's actually inside, actually we'll read it here, Farmers routinely spray their paddocks with Roundup and then graze animals on the dying plants to get the most out of the paddock. Crops are routinely, routinely sprayed with Roundup to desiccate them, that's to dry them. Some of the crops treated in this way are wheat, corn, sugar, soybeans and potatoes. Then the crop is harvested, the soil ploughed, fertilised and sown again, thus allowing the new plants to uptake the glyphosate in the soil. Now listen to this. Glyphosate can't be washed off, it's systemic. It's in the meat, in the dairy, in, it's in the milk. It's in the fresh plants and dried plants. It's actually in, it's in, it's in the plant, you can't get it out. Washing is not gonna help. GMO crops are an absolute disaster for humanity. This is the same website with 178 studies. They've got some really good stuff on there. Glyphosate is now con contained in most weed killer formulations throughout the world. It's something amazing happened just, just this year. In California, this is from uh, Mike, some of you might know Mike Adams' website, and he's a, called the Health Ranger or Natural News. He showed that California has just declared glyphosate, uh, weed killer, to be a cancer causing poison. This is amazing because they're the first ones to stand up and say it. I mean, this should be promoted all over the world. Every state should do this. But I'm sure that Monsanto has their way of keeping, good in, you know, keeping in good with uh, government departments and and people who they need to um, help them in their work. Nearly 100 lawsuits are already filed against Monsanto by cancer sufferers and more are on the way. There'll be many, many more. I'll just tell you a little bit about Monsanto before we wrap up. We've only got a few slides left. This isn't the first time Monsanto has been fined. That's in 2010, the Environmental Protection Agency fined Monsanto 2.5 million, the largest fine ever levied against the US pesticides law. In this case, Monsanto had been selling GM cotton seeds to Texas counties where they were explicitly banned by intentionally mislabeling the seeds as being non-GMO, non-GM. See that? They're sending seeds, they're saying they're non-GM when they are, and that, the, Texas must be okay because they, they banned the use of them, knowing that they were harmful. Monsanto was fined in 2005 by the Justice Department for general uh, for, for bribing Indonesian officials to approve GM seeds. They bribe people to get their business done. In 1996, the Attorney General of New York fined them for false advertising of Roundup, also known as glyphosate. The year prior, they paid $41.1 million to a Texas waste management company for hazardous waste concerns. Monsanto was also named in a $180 million lawsuit for exposing Vietnam War veterans to Agent Orange a Monsanto herbicide used in the war that is highly toxic. And, and on that point of um, the Vietnam War, you know, I, I learned something really horrible. Um, in, in that war, when Agent Orange was used, it wasn't designed to kill the people. It was designed to make them sick, to, to make them completely debilitated. The reason for it was that by having one sick person completely debilitated, you needed two people to care for that person. And by, by affecting enough people, you're putting the population out of action, at least in the area where you're spraying. It's diabolical that a war would steep to such a level where they're demobilizing, they're incapacitating the population to get their own agenda. It's a satanic fruit and fruit. Monsanto had a hand in that. This is certainly not something you'd want to have on your resume. And by the way, just so you know, these figures that we just looked at, they're nothing, friends. There's absolutely nothing for this company. Right now, in 2000, just this year, um, there was a whistleblower working for Monsanto who, who, who put them into the authorities, um, I forget what they're called in America, dealing with the tax office, for doctoring their books on their, on their um, figures for their tax return. The whistleblower got $22 million from the agency 
and Monsanto got an $80 million fine. This is their latest fine. They're copying them all the time. It means nothing to them. Money is nothing. Uh, what's interesting, what's interesting is this. According to the terms of the settlement, which means there, must, there was some negotiation between Monsanto and the, the people finding them, the, the government department or whoever they were, or the court, the law court. So, according to the terms of settlement, Monsanto was not found guilty of any wrongdoing despite the fact that they were fined for what was in fact wrongdoing. So, when the case was finished, they declared to be not guilty, right? That was the finding. So that they can come out saying, okay, well, it's, it's either not cancer causing or whatever allegation you're trying to put upon us. In this case here, it would have been manipulation of their figures for tax purposes. We're not guilty of that, but you're finding us $80 million for it. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Anyway, I've shared a lot of bad stuff. And now, on the last two slides, I want to share something good. Because there is... There is something you can do about this, because none of us are immune to this, none of, even organic farming. Although we need to eat organic, that's very important. That's the very first thing you've got to put in place. But organic farms out in the open are being sprayed with glyphosate through chemtrails. It's in the chemtrails as well. And then nanoparticles, which when, you're, when they absorb into your body, they cross the blood-brain barrier, barrier automatically, because they're so fine. And now that we know why now we know why the glyphosate is in there, because one of the comp main components in chemtrails is aluminium. And this may explain why the, the ratio of one in one, every single person on the face of this planet is affected by it. There's this really good man, and this man's name is Dr. Dietrich Klinghardt. He's a German man. He was a doctor. He has a passion for helping people the right way. He's got a practice and clinic in, in Canada. And you need to look, we watch this, this uh, YouTube video, it's only nine minutes, but he's got others. Dig them all up. It's, this would be very good research for you. This man here has done a lot of research on detoxing glyphosate and especially detoxing aluminium. He understands what's going on. He understands it's well. He's spoken on many um, important forums. He's very, very respected, uh, am respected amongst all his peers and others in his field. They, and actually, when you, when you listen to this man talk, as soon as I started to hear him, I thought to myself, man, this, this man, this man sounds just like a real Christian. You've got to look at his demeanour, the way he speaks, his, the calmness, the peace that he has. Is, he, this, you, you know, we need to listen to what this man's got to say about this particular topic. Anyway, on this little nine-minute video, what you'll find is this very simple uh, procedure that he's got, which will really help detox. Unfortunately, because we're continually consuming glyphosate, it's, it's a detox that you'd have to continually do in order to keep up with it. It's not like you do it once and it's over, because as long as you're affected by it, you need a cure as well. Now, he's got these three, um, these three supplements called Matrix Minerals, Deep Purple and Rose Hip. I know a couple, but I don't know them all. Some of you may. But these are the things you want to get into you as soon as possible and keep doing it. Um, Leo found um, s some, some people in America that can actually supply this. That you, can, you can buy it online if you want. If you want the link, let me know because I can send it to you. But this is something well worth pursuing. Um, Leo checked it out himself and you know, this young man, he really has a good mind for researching things and getting to the bottom of things and so he helped me with that as well. It's wonderful. Um, I, I have to thank Rosie for her research and also um, and Fiona for the things that she shared and opening this up to us too because we had no, no um, understanding of it. And by the way, friends, in this day and age, you know, like with the, um, the winds of doctrine that are blowing around right now, you, you think it's any a coincidence that this is the attack that Satan is mounting upon us as well as everyone else? But we're the ones that he certainly would love to go down this path. That's why the right arm of the gospel is so important and we need to adhere to it because we're not to, we're not to let God down by not acting upon the warnings that he actually brings to us. When you hear Zach, Bush, Zach Bush's testimony, I'd like to hear from you if you agree with me. I believe God orchestrated his affairs to bring him out in the open. Possibly there was no believer, or I don't know, believers in the faith who God could use to do that. But this young man here, when he speaks, you, you open your ears because you can tell he knows what he's talking about. And he's, he doesn't have any vendetta against anyone, but he's ter terribly hated by the AMA in America. And I can see why. He's, he's showing them up for what they really are. Anyway, at this very time of Earth's history, this is something I think that we all need to really seriously consider. And 
Oh, did everyone, sorry, did everyone get that? You want to see? Finish, here, you want to finish off? Get that and then I'll show you the last, we've got one slide left. But the reason I wanted to share that, that point was simply that, that you know how much time we, we might spend in study or in ministry work, people do missionary work and we're all here Christians trying to serve God and trying to make a difference and trying to help others and this is like the biggest thing that I can think of today that we need to get right in case if we want to continue that work in a successful way. Um, I know that it's very convenient to go out to Woolies or Coles in America. I think they've got Walmart and a few others. It's very convenient to go down and get your shopping, but friends, we've got to put all that away. There's no more room for that anymore. I know this might sound hard. Some of you might think, oh, how can I do it? Look, you know, nothing is impossible for God. You know that. And if you have a little backyard and a little garden, there's no reason why you can't grow a few veggies. There is no reason at all. It's actually good for you and grow them uh, organically. And better than that, what I would suggest now, one thing I would look forward to doing is having a little igloo. Grow your organ organic veggies in an enclosed environment, even though there could be some complications, but do it because that will stop the chemtrail pollution getting onto them as well. Some may still get in because the air still has to flow and it'll carry them, but, but it's still helping in some way and you're at least doing everything you can to help yourself and set a right example. And I don't know how much time we've got left, but if, we, if we're allowed to continue for another generation, or if time lasts that long, I, I can't see it, to be honest, the things that are happening in the world now make you think that, you know, an attack on Israel could happen at any time. And we know that when that happens, the next step is going to be the Muslim population. And when we see that happen, we know we're right at the very end. We are right at the end. And so that's where we are now. I'll just finish with this one last uh, slide. The sin of intemperate eating, eating too frequently, too much, and of rich, unwholesome food destroys the healthy action of the digestive organs, affects the brain and perverts the judgment, preventing rational, calm, healthy thinking and acting. Those who will not, after the light has come to them, eat and drink from principle, instead of being controlled by appetite, will not be tenacious in regard to being governed by principle in other things. And we want to be governed by principles that God places upon us. We want that. So we mustn't be indolent in our approach to how we deal with this, this issue and this problem. And there are ways. And so follow up on Dr. Dietrich Klinghart. You'll, you'll hear some wonderful things there, really wonderful things. And this, as I said, this has just started, but it's blowing up and everyone's, everyone's starting to look at it. It's a serious issue. All right. Let's, um, let's bow in prayer and thank the Lord for what he's shown us. Dear loving Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we pray and thank you, Lord, for the uh, light that you so graciously give us and the conviction that you bring with it. And we thank you for the people that you use, Lord, to, to prove these things, that we might know that they are so, that we can do our own study and research and know that this is, this is something that thou has allowed us to be aware of. We thank you for the counsel you, you had already given us as a people even back in the 1800s, before all these problems were going to be manifested. And I pray, Lord, for each and every soul here, this congregation, our friends online, all our friends around the world, I pray that we might take this seriously, do what we can to help ourselves, and then expect a blessing from thee in return. And, and we thank you for the great desire that you have to bless us, and pray that we might be those living examples, the spiritual people that you so desperately want at this time of earth's history that we may truly play a part in the finishing work. We thank you, Lord, for this and we pray you'll be with us throughout the rest of this Sabbath and we offer this prayer now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.